that gives you something to think about, doesn't it? Um, if you have questions, write them out on the cards that are in the pew. Put it on the back of the card, pass it to the center aisle, and they'll pick them up and bring them up. Um, Carl, come on up. Thank you for sharing with us. You're very welcome. Um, <clears throat> Someone handed me a couple of questions and talked to me before. One, this morning you talked about it's important that we surrender. What does that look like? Well, in my understanding, surrender is a continual moment-by-moment -moment attitude of prayer and connectedness to Christ. God, we are journeying through this life together and always in this this you know mindset that God is present uh, surrender is about uh, you know filtering all of our decisions uh, whether it's how we invest our time or our resources or money before we uh, do this or write out a check for that it's this attitude of God what would you have me to do And how, I guess I'm struggling a little bit as the person who asked the question is, how does that look? I mean, it just seems like that's work to always think about what does God want me to do. It doesn't always pop into your mind first. Yeah. How do you get it to have that relationship where that's something that comes semi-natural? Yeah, well, I would say relationships are work. <clears throat> right? Um, and I think the relationship with God uh, is no different. The, the, you know, Scripture says time and again, put, make every effort, make every effort, Peter says. Uh, and the, the Scripture is not against effort, but it's effort misplaced if that effort is to improve our standing or somehow earn our salvation before God. Our effort must be in the relationship with Christ. And uh, my relationship to my wife requires effort. Choosing to carve out time uh, to spend together. But if there was no time together, there would be no relationship. So I think, yeah, it... it is, I suppose, work to surrender, um, but it's unbelievably rewarding as well. I mean, there's no greater gift than relationships and intimacy with one another and with God. So, so it sounds like what you're saying is it's worth the focus of the work. Is the focus on God and the relationship yeah. or on me and getting yeah. me good enough? Yeah, I would say that's that a good way to put it, better than I said it. Right. Um, we mentioned earlier that you'd had some education along the way. Someone asked me to ask the question, there was a time long ago and far away where there was a group of young people at a boarding school. And there was for some reason, a group of young men who decided they wanted to get food from the cafeteria. Oh, <laughs> and, yes. And April may remember this story because it seems she, like she was there at the school at the time. It is true. Do you want me to tell that story or no? Well, sure. I, 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 just, I had wanted to make it a question. Oh, okay, what's the question? And then you tell us what I okay. want. Okay, all right, all right. The question yeah. is, this group of young people would sneak into the cafeteria and take food, and people were wondering where the food was going. So I understand one of the faculty members decided he was going to sleep in the cafeteria to catch the people? Yes. With his dog? The, the story kind of grows oh, the, the <laughs> over grows. time, okay. yeah. But I don't think there was any <laughs> dog if there was. Okay. Um, all right. But, but that's a good detail. I might include that the next time. But at any rate, uh, is it true then that these young people, whoever they were, 
went in and stepped over the sleeping faculty to get yeah. there? Yeah, well, here's how the story goes. And I have often told the story when I'm working through the story in John chapter 8, where Jesus, you know, they bring this woman who is caught in the act of adultery, and they say, the law tells us to stone this woman. What do you want us to do uh, with him? And you may remember, uh, you know, Jesus' response uh, in that setting. And so that's often where I have told this story. But the night before homely, word got out that uh, there was a big party going down up in Nestler's room, so I didn't want to miss out. We went out after the lights went out in the dorm, and I walked into Nestler's room, and they had uh, rearranged everything to turn it into this midnight casino, uh, a candle-lit casino, because they turned out the electricity at night, you may remember, in the dorms. So uh, the agenda was penny poker. Now, I'm not condoning the behavior, but I can tell you I had never played poker before in my life. I didn't even know how to play poker. Now, you call it luck, call it fate, call it whatever you want. All I know is, like, 3 o'clock in the morning, I had this mountain of pennies in front of me. Uh, and I still remember wondering, does God expect me to pay tithe <laughs> on my windfall? You know, some of the ethical questions that kids struggle with in academy. Uh, and 3 o'clock in the morning, now this is Newmarket, Virginia, very small town. You can't just order in pizza, but we were getting hungry. You have to be a little more creative, and so somebody suggests, let's raid the cafeteria. Well, like you say, everybody was doing it. I mean, like, you could get little Twinkies for your school jacket. Everybody was, you could let her in the sport. Everybody was breaking into the cafeteria. And so a couple guys raced across the campus, let themselves into the window. And when they got in, they heard the strangest thing. This <sighs> peeking around the corner there in the pantry was Mr. Strickland, the vice principal of the school. Uh, he was sick and tired of kids breaking into the cafeteria and determined to catch the culprits. The problem was, this was not his spiritual gift. <laughs> he was much too heavy of a sleeper to really pull off the sting, and so as he snored away, they literally passed chocolate eclairs right over his nose and then <laughs> blew him a kiss good night. Well, we enjoyed a feast that you can't believe that night. Doritos and eclairs, donuts, oh, it was great. Well, I saw Mr. Strickland a few years ago, and I asked him for permission to tell this story publicly, and he smiled at the memory. Uh, and then he said, you, you realize, Hafner, don't you, that you boys never would have been caught had you just kept your mouth shut. I said, well, yeah, I'm sure that's true, but come on, you know, really. <laughs> A story that good, you don't have to like, keep it to yourself. So, you know, we told a few who told a few. But before long, it got out all over campus. Next thing we knew, we were all sitting outside of the principal's office waiting our turn to go in one by one before the disciplinary committee. So I went in, Nessa went in, Kevin went in. We all went in. The last guy to go in was Jeff. After he had shared his rendition of the story, the principal leaned onto his mahogany desk and peered over his glasses sitting low on the nose and he growled, now is there anything else, young man, that you want to say to us before we punish the whole lot of you? And it was in that moment that Jeff quoted John chapter 8, verse 7. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone I had never heard that verse before, and just like that, it became and still remains my favorite verse <laughs> in the whole Bible. I love that verse, and I think it's true, and I think the story relates to what we're talking about tonight, this propensity that I think we all have as church people who play by the rules, like the elder brother and the prodigal son, to have this judgmental spirit that people need to be as righteous as I am, you know? Um, and Jesus teaches, let he who is without sin play that role of judge. That's the story, Dwayne. And I'm sticking you. to it. Very good. I heard this, one of the students, when they went in, said you really shouldn't get us for stealing because we would paid for cafeteria food anyway. That's good. <laughs> that, maybe not quite as good as quoting scripture, but that's not bad, yeah. There you go. All right, a couple of questions here. Uh, one is, 
don't you think that Adventists especially, or any Christians, need a deeper conviction of sin with only two possible results, weeping at the altar or heading for the exits, furious that their righteousness had been taken away? Well said. I like that. I'd like to put that in my next book. Uh, yeah, I, I do. That we, and I'll just speak for myself, I more and more realize um, my desperate need uh, to feel a deeper conviction of what my sin costs God and the depth of grace. You know, Ellen White makes a comment that eternity begs for time to understand the cross, and I think that's so true that we'll, we'll never fully understand the atonement and the righteousness of Christ and the whole story of salvation. And a big piece of that, of course, is an understanding of our sin. And it's easy to see the sin of other people. But it's real easy to be pretty blind to our own offenses before a just and holy God. So I think there is a huge need, not just in Adventism, but in all of Christendom to, to understand our need of grace, every one of us, yeah. Any other questions? Pass them into the aisle and we'll do it. Um, someone is thinking about celery, I guess. Yeah, I'm seeing this. <laughs> and they asked the technical question, you might call it. Should we pay tithe on gift money? It's a similar question to one that I think we've all heard, maybe asked. I get asked this question often, and that is, do I pay tithe on gross or net, or do I you know, pay tithe on this or that? And my answer there has always been, well, do you want God to bless your gross or net? I don't think tithing should become a legalistic Thing at all. The, the reality is, as we live out this kingdom life that God invites us to experience, we ultimately benefit. And so we don't pay tithe on gift money because we're super spiritual or because we want, you know, a greater blessing of God necessarily, but just because it's in response, it's always in response to an understanding of grace, always whether we're paying on gift money or gross or net or not gift money or whatever, you know, I think any other motive for paying tithe or any offerings comes from a tainted heart. Uh, and I think it all goes back to a humble heart before you know, a just and holy God that my tithe paying, my church attendance, my missionary, volunteerism, anything I do is just in response. Hey, God has been so gracious to me. But what else can I do but to just surrender my time, my money, my gift money, whatever. Surrender my life fully to God. Um, <clears throat> I brought up some books that somebody says here, Carl Hafner was the author of some of these. All right. Um, can you tell us about the different books and if I could only buy one, which one should I buy? Or at least a little bit about what's in okay, them so well, make the choice. Okay, sounds good. I'll just go through them as okay. you have. Um, okay, and I, by the way, I did not ask him to ask me to promote my book. So That's true. I don't want this to come off as self-promoting, but, well, here we go. Uh, okay, this one is probably the best-selling book I've ever had. Uh, and that is The Cure for Soul Fatigue. Uh, I, through the years, over the last 15 years, many times I have surveyed my congregations, and these are both college campuses, asking people of all ages, you know, what topics do you want to hear addressed from the pulpit? Every time I've ever done this, uh, in the top three always is the topic of soul fatigue, a pace of life. I think, you know, if there's one thing I hear over and over and over and over again around the church is, you know, just so exhausted. I am so overstretched and busy. 
Uh, you know, and, and this strikes me. Every time you ask somebody, how are you doing? If they expound beyond the typical oh, fine or good, whatever, almost inevitably, <laughs> people will say something like, oh, you just can't believe how busy I am, right? I got to take the kids to soccer practice on Wednesday night. I'm volunteering at the church. I'm working full time. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. And when's the last time you asked somebody, so how are you doing? And they responded by saying, well, I just don't know what to do with all my free time. Because I've really carefully thought through my values, what I want my life to be about. And so every day, I carve out a chunk of time that reflects my deepest values. You know, I'm committed to God and to my spouse. And so every day, I just make sure that God gets the most and the best time, my wife, and so on. Oh, who lives like that? But the better question is, why don't we live like that? Jesus invites us, come those who are worn out, stressed out, burned out, and find rest for your soul. And so that's really the key text on this book. And like I say, it really struck a nerve. And so the publishers asked me to write a sequel to Cure for Soul Fatigue. And so that's what this book came out of a couple years later called Soul Matters. And it's on the same basic topic. So we got two with that little sermon. Uh, no greater love. I've been working on this book for 15 years, literally. It was accepted for publication 15 years ago uh, when I had the idea and pitched it to Pacific Press. I said, we love the idea. Go ahead and write it. And so I started writing it, uh, and it just came out a couple of months ago. So it's hot off the press. Uh, and what this is is a collection of stories that I have told or my father has told primarily for communion services. When my dad retired from ministry after 40 years of being a pastor, I went to some of his old parishes. Um, people from Minot, North Dakota, where he pastored, Providence, Rhode Island, Roanoke, Virginia, Portland, Oregon, all of these different former church members. And on videotape, I asked them, what do you remember about my dad when he served as the pastor at your church? Over and over, I'm telling you, every person, every person said, well, what we remember best about your dad is we loved his communion stories. Every communion, four times a year, uh, he wouldn't preach. He would simply tell a story, a story about some human sacrifice where somebody makes the ultimate sacrifice and often, you know, gives their own life in order to save somebody else. Uh, one fella retold the story that he remembered that's in the book. And he started tearing up. He was in his 90s. He has since died. He was in his 90s at the time when I videotaped him. And he said, uh, I remember this story. And then he started telling me the story. And of course, I knew the story. I had told the story. And I asked him, well, have you heard the story since? No, it's been about 25 years, I think, since I heard. But it just made such an impact on me. Uh, I love that story. Uh, and so a long time ago, I thought, wouldn't it be great to put together an anthology of my dad's communion file stories? And so I uh, raided his communion file. The problem and why it took so long is because, you know, many of them were from old Reader's Digest, and when I'd contact Reader's Digest, I couldn't figure out who was the copyright holder. I was just a nightmare. And some of you know books by Joe Wheeler, and he was sort of helping me with this process. He's written 75 or so anthologies, Christmas in My Heart, all those books. And he said, oh, Carl, you know, it's, you know, collections like this of stories are very, very difficult to do because it's almost impossible sometimes to find the copyright holders. Or if you find them, then they want $10,000 to reprint the story and so on. So anyway, that's why it took so long. And a lot of the stories that are in my dad's communion file I simply couldn't use because I couldn't find uh, the copyright holder. But anyway, I've put some more modern stories in it, but they're, they're all about that. So if you love good, good stories, that's this book, No Greater Love. Okay, Pilgrim's Problems uh, simply goes through a lot of things that Christians struggle with. So uh, it addresses things like failure, loneliness, anger, loss, resentment, guilt, pride, fear, greed, futility. That's Pilgrim's Problems. 
out of the hot tub into the world is a commentary on the book of James. And they changed, that used to be a cover, kind of a cartoon picture of a guy getting out of a hot tub. It's the same book, it just now looks much more intellectual in its cover. And it's part of a timeless Adventist classics series. Uh, but this is on the book of James. So a lot of stories in there as we kind of work our way through James. Uh, Caught Between Two Worlds is similar to Out of the Hot Tub. This is on James. This is on the epistles of Peter. So First and Second Peter, where he, of course, talks a lot about the end of time and uh, last day events and uh, you know, makes statements like, uh, when you see these things happening, know that the end of time is near. And it's going to happen like a thief in the night, so watch and wait. So a lot of last days uh, eschatology themes are in this book, but it, again, it's sort of a commentary through the book of uh, First and Second Peter. And then this one just came out last week. This is the one that they sent to your house from the press because I, d I didn't even have it uh, yet. And this one's uh, simply titled Destiny. Uh, who you are and what you're here to do. And especially, I think it's a wonderful gift to a graduate, or if you have graduates or kids, young people especially, because it addresses issues like purpose and why am I here and what is God calling me to do. But really, uh, those questions transcend age brackets because I think we all desperately uh, want to you know, know that we're here for a purpose, that we're here... Uh, to make a difference uh, in our lives. And so that's what, what this book, and it just came out, um, that's what this one talks about. So, Do you find that helpful? It's hard to go to a table with all these books and say, what are these all about? There are also a couple of DVD sets that are um, week of prayers that I did. Both of them are at Walla Walla University. Uh, one is very similar to the Soul Matters, and then... Um, the other one, and I think we only had two of the DVD sets, but they're a series of seven sermons. Uh, and the other one, I forget what it was about, but it's really good, trust me. <laughs> no, I don't, I don't even remember what it was about. It's a white cover, and we have a few more of those. And that's a series of like seven or eight sermons, like you've heard here this weekend. So anyway, that's what that is. Well, it looks like it's time to go and get some refreshments and right. to look at what's on the book table. So let's just pray as we close. Dear God, as we thought tonight about ourselves, we ask that you help us as we go home to be honest with ourselves and honest with you. Help us in this week to represent you right to those we come in contact with, for we ask it in your name.